This is a show that brings to the forefront newsmakers, entertainers, and those making a difference in our lives and in our world. Each week is a new adventure with topics ranging from the most serious and cutting edge to the most lighthearted and entertaining. This is Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon. Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon. This is Taking Care of Business and Rocket Green Radio. We have a really interesting show today. Today, we, we, we brought the folks from Rooted Spaces. You're going to need to know about them because these are really, for, for lack of a, a, a better word, green building people. So we have with us two really cool experts. We have Guy Vardy and we have Kristen Pertelli. So thank you guys for coming and joining us on the show and being a part hey, Rich, of, thanks for having us. of Rocket Green Radio. Great to be here. We're so glad that you, you, you took precious time out of your day to be with us. Uh, uh, Antonio Sayon, our co-host, is on assignment elsewhere uh, doing other work uh, you know, that, to promote eco-pioneers, but he'll be back uh, in our next episode. So t- t- for, for the people out there, let's get on your computers or your smartphones and put in rootedspaces.com. But for those driving and can't touch their phones because <laughs> of driving laws, why don't you guys... Take take a little bit of a, a, a trip with us to explain how Rooted Spaces got started and what Rooted Spaces actually does. So I, I think I'll start with uh, explaining what Rooted Spaces actually does. So we're essentially a consultancy firm. We help building owners, developers, and property managers really take the, br- the green building concept to a whole nother level. And the premise, I guess, for this is that uh, urban environments, cities, of course, are completely disconnected from all natural elements. Uh, Cities throughout their involvement over the past few hundred years have set as a mission to completely separate inhabitants from anything natural. And that's, that's what we wanted to do for all these years. And it's only very recently that we've realized that this had very damaging effects on all people in general. Uh, for me personally, the realization came on a long bike ride. <laughs> so like most New Yorkers, I was working too many hours, too many days in the week, living too stressful, too stressful of a life. And I decided to take a year off. This was about, this was a few years ago. And um, I guess adopt a much healthier lifestyle. And so I began cycling specifically long distance cycling. And I learned to look forward to these long rides once a week. And me and a few friends would leave the city on our bikes, literally biking from the city to sometimes up to Bear Mountain and back. So this is about a a 70, 80 mile round trip. We loved it. And we realized that we get a certain, you know, quote unquote, high from being around nature for all these hours. And Coming back to the city, crossing the bridge on one of these rides, uh, I noticed it was a very nice day outside, and people were swarming the parks like I've never seen before. Like I'm, I'm sure all New Yorkers have seen on a, on a nice sunny day, Central Park, where you see so many people, you can't even see patches of grass on the park. It's that crowded. And, and that's when it all of a sudden hit me, that the biggest amenity this city, and really any city has, is that connection to nature. And that makes perfect sense when you see the type of premiums that people pay for, you know, uh, apartments or offices with whatever park views or water views, et cetera. Um, uh, This all just made sense. And so I felt that this city is really too crowded and there's too many technological advancement, just like you were recently discussing on your show, a lot of really cool things that are out there now that people are just not aware of. And it, I felt it's time to bring back nature into the city big time and really connect the inhabitants uh, with a natural experience. And that's what Rooted Spaces is about. So, so you killed the styrofoam coffee cup? <laughs> a thousand percent, yeah. Okay. Killed the styrofoam coffee cup. <laughs> and and, the, and the, the plastic polyurethane lunch. <laughs> I'd like to add to that. Please do, on please do. That, that, this is Kristen, folks. On top of that, um, not only are the health benefits incredible, which Guy briefly mentioned, but for a landlord or developer, the financial long-term profits, are a bonus on top of that. 
So it works hand in hand with each other, which it works perfectly with our business model as well. So uh, how does this work? You know, we're, we're now surrounded by a lot of electronic signals and there's electronic signals everywhere. In fact, um, they, they, there are some people who caution you to take your portable phones and put them in a shielding device because of what they're concerned about with long-term exposure and things like that. Do you guys deal with um, those kinds of issues as well? Uh, we touched less on that. We absolutely address the health and, when- and well-being of either residents or visitors or tenants in a specific property. Uh, so that would fall under that umbrella, but it's not a specific field of focus for us, to be okay. honest. We do focus on indoor uh, air quality, for example, water management, energy utilization, things like that. So do you work with existing buildings as well as new construction? Correct. We do both. Um, so if I had... If, both re- go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I said, so we both retrofit existing buildings. At the moment, for example, one of our clients is um, a single-story retail building in Hell's Kitchen that's actually um, used by a restaurant. Uh, that's our client. And uh, the restaurant owner is looking to create an edible uh, vegetable garden on the roof of this building. So we're assisting him with that. And then on another hand, we have a developer client who's putting up, uh, what is it, about 130,000 square feet of um, a senior care facility uh, that's going to be in the Bronx. And we're helping him with the whole design process from, you know, from start to finish. So we, we do handle both aspects. Now, you, do you do mostly the New York City area or do you do nationwide or, or you know, t- t- tell me about the scope and depth of your business. Like what's your reach? Absolutely. So we do offer our services nationwide and to be completely frank on, on something like this, we can even offer, you know, international consultation services, but obviously we're all New Yorkers. We're based and, and we're all, you know, we love the city and this is our main focus and our <laughs> our backyard. So obviously we would love to see some great things happen in New York. Both our projects right now are in the New York City area. Okay. Um so let's 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 talk about an existing building. Let's say I either own a shopping center or a commercial building or even a residential building and I want it to be greener. I don't have a giant budget, but I I'm, I I would like to make some changes. Uh, sure. to, to enhance the marketability of the building, to give it a, a healthier you know, approach, especially if I have tenants who are doctors or yoga instructors or things like that, and I want oh, to bring, bring something to them. So I'll sit down with you and I'll say, all right, I own these different properties. W- what's the menu? What are the menu items that are available? I'm not looking to take a wrecking ball and start from the ground up. I, I can't displace people. But I want to do something. I want to make some kinds of changes. What are the what are the the basic menu items that um, I could start looking at, and, and you would be telling me the pros and cons and the costs of you know these different broad categories of items? Of course. Well, it, it would certainly start with uh, a site tour, where uh, typically myself and a few of our other team members we do have in our team as well. I should mention. Um, one of our partners is Barack Pliskin from Pliskin Architecture, who is a brilliant architect, um, who's done some very interesting projects with some of the bigger shops in town and elsewhere. He also has some international experience under his belt. Uh, so he is, uh, of course, the creative genius in our team. And then we can't forget Mr. Scott Smith, who's also heading uh, Hunter Property Advisors. He has extreme, vast experience in anything to do with environmental remediation and a lot to do with structural, structural engineering. He's also a very accomplished developer on his own right. And so um, typically a few of us would visit the site, tour it, typically with the property owner or the client himself, if the client is a tenant, for example, or the building manager. And... Um, that would really be the beginning for the creative process, right? We need to see what the property looks like. Where could potentially something be added? What would be, like you'd mentioned, the pros and cons of this potential addition? 
And then from there, we would get back to our office and typically come up with um, two to three different ways of attacking the beast, if you will. So we would get back to the client with, you know, we can offer plan A would cover, say, the roof and some interior and some basement space. Like we would do the whole everything bells and whistles. Plan B is going to be a slightly scaled down version of that. And plan C is, of course, going to be like the most minimal um, additions that we see viable in the immediate future. What most clients do not understand going into this process, and that's where we really love seeing their eyes open up big, is that there's actually grants in place that an owner or a manager or definitely a developer could tap into and have a lot of these uh, expenses be covered by various agencies. So it doesn't necessarily all have to fall on the client's budget. See, that's that's fascinating. Um, yeah. On a more micro level, when you talk about the site tours, could you could you sharpen the focus for us and help us see what are the things that you're addressing? Is it um, energy use? Is it the the different kinds of alternative energies that could be used? Is it about green? greening the building uh, in terms of, you know, vegetation, uh, flowers. Tell, tell me more specifically. So, uh, absolutely. The, the idea and the premise is really to tie the building back in with the natural environment, to, to make the building part of the ecosystem that surrounds it and not have it be completely separated from it. So, certainly, if, if the roof is currently bare, we would love to see this roof turn green. Uh, that helps with migrating birds, for example. That helps with pollination. That, that does so many wonderful things, not even to mention the insulation benefits of that alone. Um, and let me course, just add to that, one, green, yeah. green could also mean anything from just plantings or an actual rooftop garden, which could be edible to the residents in the building. So, so it when, could work either way. So when someone says, I need to go for a snack, and they go to the roof, no one's going to like think, you know, <laughs> that that's odd. <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, in, in many ways, uh, it's like, you know, it's like, I'll be right back. I need some mint for my tea. Um, how do you deal with uh, climate, uh, you know, the, ch the, the climate issues? So, for example, you have a rooftop garden. Uh, do you use like a greenhouse for the winter so that you can still grow, or is, uh, is it more limited to be in conformance with the actual seasons that are present? So it's really very much a question of what is the project and what is the client trying to achieve, uh, right? So if the client is looking to have an edible garden on the roof in the northeast, yeah, a greenhouse has to have it has to be part of that you know equation in some way, shape, or form. Certainly, we have uh, at least a third of the year where the temperatures get just too cold to have anything edible grow there. Um, so there are solutions to every problem, but it really is a question of what it is that the client is looking to achieve. Now, it, so let's talk a little bit about pests and pest control. You know, if you've ever been on the subway, you see there's all these little creatures on the tracks. Um, oh, if, you, yeah. if you bring <laughs> vegetables and food, uh, they're going to be owls and great things that you want and maybe there'll be some kind of unwanted creatures how do you deal with that and how do you differentiate between the winners and losers of wildlife that get to enjoy the snacks that you'll be creating absolutely so uh, on each and every project besides our very qualified team members we then also collaborate so we have a very extensive network of ecologists and engineers energy experts scientists various government agencies, all kinds of other experts that we all pull in and tap into, uh, depending on the project and the project's needs. So if, for example, we're looking at mitigating the effects of predatory birds, then there's a specific agency we would approach, or a specialist, rather, that we would work with on, on something like that. It also is a question of, you know, if the property is in, for example, Westchester County, you'd be looking at different um, challenges versus deep in Long Island or South Jersey, because uh, obviously these are all eco-environments that are unique on their own right. Now, do, you, do you also employ things like solar or wind um, energy into your yes. buildings? How does that work? Uh, 
So absolutely, we, we certainly improve the energy efficiency and we always push where it's possible, of course, for the property to be completely energy independent. Um, in a perfect world, each building is completely a net producer and we really believe that's the model, that that's the new model that we should all you know, strive for. We need to make this world much more carbon free. <laughs> No, without without a doubt. Um, what does the typical building consume? Because it's in in some ways, when you think about it, all summer long you're cooling them off, uh, so you need to create all this heat, you know, essentially to create the electricity that's used to cool it, and then you reverse it by creating more heat to heat the building. Um, are, are there ways to sort of cool buildings down without? sort of the traditional HVAC? Is there a way to cool a building off by, like, say, extracting heat as opposed to, you know, using Freon and, and you know, all that stuff? Absolutely, Rich. There's actually several different technologies uh, that you see a bit more, po a bit more used in, in Europe and Southeast Asia, um, pertaining to more passive building, but yes, one does not have to rely on HVAC to keep temperature um, controlled environments. There are many different ways to approach that. It's, of course, a question of what type of property we're looking at and how, how much of a budget or what kind of a plan the client has in place. Uh, what we have seen to be the case, Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong, typically I would say at least 30% of the property's income is allocated toward expenses. And after real estate taxes, of course, the lion's share of the expenses would be heating and cooling. Um, there's a significant portion of that that could completely be eliminated using these advanced technologies. Uh, it's easier to do in a new construction than it is to retrofit, uh, to be completely frank. But again, depending on the building, there are quite a few different solutions. It's a bit hard to put, um, I guess, um, a three, four family in the same bag, if you will, as, you know, a midtown office building and um, multifamily in uptown Manhattan, for example, because they're all completely different properties. And e each one, of course, has its own benefits and, and disadvantages and its own unique ch challenges. Uh, but there are certainly ways of improving and um, enhancing that natural experience with each one of these properties. All right. So hold it right there. This is Richard Solomon. I am with uh, Kristen and Guy from Rooted Spaces. And we'll be right back. Keep it locked in. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Scott Schenlinger, and you're listening to Richard Solomon, WCWP 88.1 FM. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Richard Solomon for Taking Care of Business, Rocket Green Radio, and sometimes they call us out of the question. And we are talking to Guy and Chris from Rooted Spaces. And, and they're, they're really a very cool, innovative company, and, and I really applaud what they're really doing out there. And that's, that's really the focus of our show when we do the environmental series, we really feature eco-pioneers. And in my opinion, these are definitely eco-pioneers that you guys need, that the, the listeners out there really need to, 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 to learn about. Um, so but way before this, this, the inspirational bike ride from Bear Mountain where the lightning bolt hit you and you said, hey, I got to do this. Um, <laughs> what, what, what really was the, the longer lead up to all of the, uh, the inspirations that, that ultimately you know, accumulated to becoming Rooted Spaces? Um, well, for, for me personally, I've had a long passion for real estate architecture ever since I remember myself. Um, originally born and raised in Israel, I moved to the States in 2002, so it's been some time. And I got into real estate pretty much when I was fresh off the boat. I uh, started with residential leasing, moved up to residential sales. Within a couple of years, I was doing investment sales, selling development sites in Manhattan in the early 2000s. I moved on to develop uh, real estate. Um, I did that in the state of Georgia. That was in 2006. Spent a couple of years doing that, M mainly ground up residential projects and then uh, moved back to New York in 2009. I joined 
Kristen and the team at HiCap. Um, that's an investment sales, it's a boutique investment sales firm. So I joined them, it was what, 2014, 2015, Kristen? <laughs> I forget. <laughs> 2015, uh, I think. 2015. And there was just instant chemistry, great synergy with, uh, with me and the group and Kristen in particular. I found uh, Kristen had a lot of the same passions as I when it came to architecture and design and green initiatives. And I was kind of using Kristen as my, um, my thought board, if that makes sense. I was bouncing off ideas off of her throughout. And she really helped me formulate this Rooted Spaces venture that we launched uh, almost a year ago now. Now, when you were in Israel, was there, was, the, was there a focus in development and in construction in that country with an eye towards the environment? Because uh, I just I, know that here there really isn't. Yes, absolutely. I, I, to be completely honest, at the time, and I, I've left Israel many years ago, I say now. Uh, at the time, there wasn't really, but I certainly have noticed that since I've left, probably about 10 years ago or so, uh, they have certainly started putting much more emphasis on that. So you do see more recently built projects that do certainly incorporate more natural elements, but still I don't think uh, they really took full advantage of all the solutions that are out there. I think the more groundbreaking projects that I personally have seen came out of places like Singapore, Australia, Vietnam even. Um, you see a lot of really incredible green projects that really take it all the way. So why, why are those countries more in the lead than other places? That's a fantastic question. Is, is it a cultural uh, thing? Is it an economic thing? Is it that... Um, they don't, you know, they have to really maximize the, the use of their space. They have more green zones. What's, what's, the, it, what's the driving force? I'll tell you, I think honestly, and this is just a, you know, a theory, of course. Um, I think it's a combination of all of, all of, all of the above. Uh, mostly you see the, uh, the folks that are really pushing this are the more creative companies when they come in and develop their own properties, naming, you know, the, the the tech giants that everybody is familiar with, for example, if you look at the, the buildings that they had recently built, be it in Silicon Valley or elsewhere around the world, you really see them uh, taking that to heart and um, fully utilizing a whole range of green solutions. So they would create, um, I, for example, I, I must refer to Amazon's most recent uh, project. Uh, their headquarters in Seattle. That's just an incredible, an incredible building. Those three spheres with the jungles inside. Um, I would encourage everybody that's passionate about green buildings to look that up. But that, to me, is the model for the future. Um, that's basically um, almost like a rainforest turned into an office building. If wow. you will. <laughs> yeah. I, Kristen. Yes. What was your path? Well, I had grand plans to become an attorney, such as yourself. And after but you were saved. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was divine intervention that made you do something much cooler. <laughs> I think so. I think so. So after graduating from Syracuse, I landed at a law firm as a paralegal, and I was in their real estate department for about a year, and I became... Um, very intrigued by all the deals that they were doing. And it was at Duval and Sackenfeld, and they pointed me in the direction of brokerage. And I landed at my first real estate firm with my partners, Larry Ross and Josh Goldflam. And we were there working together on investment sales for about seven years. And then we decided to go out on our own in 2008. And um, I always loved architecture and working on landmark buildings and any building that had a bit of a story to it and a history to it, um, vacant buildings that would become something, but that also kept their original character always intrigued me. And Guy and I had a lot of that in common. Um, he came to me one day and started talking about biophilic design, and I had no idea really what it was, so I started doing a little bit more research. 
and we kept having conversations about it, and it was very intriguing. And we put together a great group, um, and that's sort of where Rooted Spaces became involved. Uh, I have to say hello to Larry Ross because he's a great human being, and uh, he, he's involved in some great ventures. That's all I'll, I'll say for, for now. But if Larry, if you're listening, thank you. Uh, <laughs> he's the one who helped introduce all of us in, in this particular <laughs> endeavor, so thank you for that. Thank um, you, Larry. Let me, let me ask you a question to, to either one of you or both. How do you deal with certain things like, you know, New York City has all these underground streams. Do you actually take advantage of that? Because we seem to, when we do construction, look to defeat that more than harness it in, in construction. I, I do a lot of construction litigation, so I, I kind of see all the, <laughs> all the stuff. So, you know, so there's like an underground stream. So we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to dig it up. We're going to put pylons in and we're going to make sure that, you know, you know, humans beat nature back and we, you know, drain, drain the wetlands and fill it in and, you know, that kind of thing. I'm amazed at some of the, like, like literally, um, I don't know if you know, uh, part of Queens has a thing called Brookville Boulevard and literally Brookville Boulevard cuts through a swamp, cuts through a swamp. And on the left side of you, right side of you is like all this marshland. And, and the first thing I'm, I was, I always think of when I go through it, um, you know, when, when, anytime I'll drive by it, is why did they have to build a road through the swamp? Was that was that really necessary? Um, couldn't they just you know inconvenience people and just go around it? You know, and I and I sometimes wonder why we do what we do. So so in terms of things like wetlands and underground streams, which are I understand there's a lot of under, underground streams in Manhattan. How, do you guys deal with that at all? Yeah, I'll tell you, Rich, to be honest, I think uh, when it comes to things like that, underground streams, it's, um, it's I think, a bit more relevant to address these things when you're doing a very large-scale uh, master plan community. Uh, th- then you could, of course, take, take that stream that's underground and really figure out what you want to do or harness it to your own use, rather. Uh, in in a market like New York City and its boroughs, where the parcels are individually are basically very small, you might have a very small section of that stream running under your property, but you can't control what your next door neighbor on either side or across the street is doing with their property. So you could potentially have all kinds of problems with that down the road, and that's why we typically refrain from from getting involved with that. All right, but let me let me take you into ima- the imaginary world. If if you had a big enough piece of property, what could you do with an underground stream? Oh, if anything. Uh, <laughs> well, in other words, so I'm giving you, you know, you, you know, sort of, you know, free license to dream here, which is all right. Let's say we we're going to get a gigantic parcel and redevelop a whole area, and it happens to be an underground stream. Is there something you could do with that that would actually be consistent? with the environment and yet be a, a, a green or a green building? Oh, absolutely. We can harness the stream and, and use it to generate energy. We can also utilize the stream as an amenity for the residents. We could create a potential pool for the residents to use or a fishing element, things of that nature, or even just, just something beautiful to look at. Um, but, yeah, certainly there will be an energy harnessing uh, element to this. I would suspect. What are the tougher challenges in your job? Is it winning hearts and minds? Is it giving your vision clarity to people who may not be able to see things the way that you see it? Um, it is it economics? Yeah, I, I would say that. I mean, if from, and I'm sure you, you see the same from your experience. You work with a lot of landlords and developers. These people are typically more set in their ways. Uh, and it's, uh, I think the biggest challenge for us as, as a bit of a startup right now is to get people to open their minds into things that work and work amazingly well in other parts of the world and just have them incorporated in, in, in their existing properties and projects here in New York. Uh, most folks would say, or I wouldn't say most folks, but a few of the people I've approached said basically, you know, if it's not broke, why fix it? All right, so I value, right. <laughs> all right, so 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 let's let's take a little trip through you know the wonders of imagination. Yeah, a group of billionaire investors say, "Hey, 
knock my socks off. We want to build a, okay. a commercial building, but we want to make it like sort of like you know your jungle in Seattle. But we want to do it in New York, and we want to make it more New York centric. What would you put in the building? What would you recommend? You know, I'm talking about you know the, the, we're an open canvas, and the palette's yours. What would you What would you want to see uh, so that when news media and other people and, and and other developers came in to spy on what you were doing and what you accomplished, what would you want them to see? Well, it's sure. always so nice I, to start I, with the lobby. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Guy, and I was going to say uh, that either a, a, a <laughs> walk. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I think it, it, what I envision when you're giving me such a description is a very large-scale office building somewhere in Midtown, for example. That's when we can really go crazy, uh, quote-unquote crazy. There's a lot of, uh, obviously, communal areas that we would love to get in and do something with. We would uh, definitely plan a green living wall in the lobby to greet people as they come. We would probably incorporate some probiotic air filtration throughout the property that really helps with uh, mitigating all kinds of toxins um, that people suffer from typically in these buildings. You know, are, are you familiar with the sick building syndrome? I, I actually know what sick building syndrome is because uh, many years ago I did asbestos litigation. So okay. I, I know I know all of course. Oh, I need I, you know, in the asbestos litigation, there were two components to the litigation. There was the personal injury litigation, which was essentially was damage to respiratory systems of people who came into higher concentrations of asbestos through you know industrial construction and you know manufacturing settings. And then there was the property uh, issues. And then there was issues, I don't get into all the details, but about, you know, friability of asbestos, you know, asbestos was in all kinds of things. There was vinyl asbestos tiles, VATs. And then, you know, a long time ago, buildings were drafty. So oh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of kind of fresh air somehow got in. And, and then once they tightened up those buildings and they made it so that there was less air exchange, and then you had things like carpeting and paint all those fumes yep. just kind of came in, and who were the people inside, other than kind of big sponges to absorb all these chemicals? And you hear stories about people having headaches and you know energy loss and, and inability to focus. And then when you throw I, in, I, I, I mean, if, if there's any justification to all these. Starbucks and branches I see on every street corner. That's got to be it, right? <laughs> you see people drinking coffee nonstop. <laughs> uh, and none of that, but you throw in sort of the fluorescent lights that don't, you know, that don't really, uh, you know. And, everybody's tired. They have a tough time focusing. They cough. They sneeze. They develop allergies. There's all kinds of bad stuff happening. Right. And then the blue sure. light. Remember the blue, you know, all these computer screens actually kind of drain you a little bit too. And then there's all the EMF. Mm-hmm that comes off the cell phones and the Wi-Fis and things like that. Right. So yep. in many ways, you know, going to work is sort of a challenge to your health. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> a so, thousand percent. So, yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm so, yeah, so, so the, you, 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 you hit the nail on the head because I, I, I know. So what, what are the cures for, for the sick building syndrome? So there's actually, um, we recently partnered with a very exciting company, and they offer a proprietary solution, which is, um, I I don't want to get into too much detail here and and technical jargon, but... It's just very broad in general, you know. Yeah, uh, let's call it probiotic air filtration. Okay. So very very much like the probiotics that people take in their diet, there's a way where we can now disperse those safely in the space. And just by doing so, they mitigate almost all of the effects of the sick building syndrome. It's, it's really incredible. So now you don't have to free base yogurt anymore. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> Actually, there's a, 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 a well-known air ventilation company um, that advertises a lot on commercial radio around here. And one of the things that they're actually doing is they're putting, they're actually putting out into the marketplace portable air filters that have a probiotic uh, you know component to them so I think the idea is catching on which is kind of nice because I, I think we we need to see that you know more which is for people to know what, what is a probiotic and how does it actually enhance your health 
And I, and I know not from a medical point of view, more from a building point of view. Well, no, essentially it's the same point of view. The medical and the building is the same, right? So we keep our environments clean, but by doing so, we also kill good bacteria. So not all bacteria is bad for us. There's actually quite a bit of bacteria that's good and important for the human body, but we unfortunately kill and destroy it on a regular basis. And um, probiotics are really the good bacteria. So you're just helping balancing your immune system and a lot of other good bodily functions by inserting that back into your system. All right. So this is Richard Solomon. This is uh, our second segment is uh, out of time for the moment, but we'll be back for our final segment in, in just a moment. If you're just joining us, it is rootedspaces.com. We have Guy and Kristen with us who are you know, just fantastic people to, to really hear their great stories, insights, and wisdom about green building, uh, innovation in the uh, real estate and development world. So keep it locked in. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Anastasia Zeltos from Athens, Greece, and we listen to Richard Solomon on our computers, and we love it. All right, welcome back. Richard Solomon, greetings to all of our listeners out there. Rootedspaces.com. If you're in front of a computer, catch their website, rootedspaces.com. I have Guy and Kristen with me from Rooted Spaces, and we're talking about uh, green construction, green building, you know, green real estate projects, and, and, and so much more. So what was your first major project? So we... We worked with a fantastic company called Foxy, De- Foxy Development uh, on one of their developments in, in the Bronx section of New York. And they, uh, well, it started as a broker. I helped the developer assemble the site. It was actually three parcels that we put together um, as a package deal, and he ended up closing on them. And the, the project initially started as uh, just a supportive senior housing center, you know, Nothing too exciting, to be honest with you. <laughs> it was a, a, t- a tight budget. You see a lot of these types of projects happening uh, throughout New York, taking advantage of various you know, uh, subsidies and tax breaks. And certainly there was no luxury to be had in, in terms of development and elements that the development would benefit from. And I, I got pretty close to this client throughout the process of selling him the site and had mentioned to him rooted spaces, of course, and that we had several ideas and how we can potentially take his project to basically another level using these ideas and have that not cost him any extra on top of his existing development budget. And just by saying that, we caught his attention. And we were very lucky um, to have been given the chance, and he really brought us in from the get-go, from the pre-development stages, on meetings with the architects and the engineers, et cetera. Uh, Barack, our partner, our architect partner, was very much involved. And we were able to um, basically make a boring building into the first, well, I should say what would have been a boring building, into one of the Bronx's first fully biophilic projects. And we were very excited about that. So imagine 177 units of senior housing, <laughs> basically, on this corner in the Morrisiana section of the Bronx. It's about 130,000 square feet. It's a corner property. And we were able to bring in a green uh, living wall into the lobby. We're creating a rooftop garden uh, in a partnership with a very exciting company that's going to help the, the folks at the center actually maintain this garden as well once it's built. Um, there's going to be obviously a backyard, and the backyard is going to be attached to a communal kitchen, which will have a greenhouse. So the elderly folks will actually have uh, gardening classes and cooking classes, uh, talking and explaining what to do with all these fresh products that they just picked from either the roof garden or the backyard. Um, There's another uh, public school that's located directly across the street from the site. And we're now in discussions with the school to have some sort of a plan where students come in and help the elderly and vice versa. We feel that's a great connection and would really help to tie it in with the local community there. 
everybody's very excited about that, and we really feel that's a home run. I feel like we, we haven't, we weren't, we we probably wouldn't be able to get this product um, off the ground and and launched if we were just a bunch of you know tree hugging hippies. I think we really bring um, a different outlook to this project because of our professional experience, because we're all real estate people. We're not strangers to the real estate world. We know what returns are expected to be. We know what developers are looking to achieve, and we're helping them get getting that done. So it would be very interesting would be for the biomedical people to survey all of the residents uh, in the senior housing and compare those stats to someone in sort of the standard generic elderly residential kind of living and see how much better the population is doing on a mental alertness basis, on a health oh, basis. Oh, sure. Cog- cognitive abilities. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There has been some research in that space, but typically what you see is the more um, luxurious senior housing facilities to incorporate these things. So it's, uh, it's really quite exciting to see what a more affordable senior housing um, project would do to the uh, residents. Well, not only that, but if you think about uh, the selfish interest of insurance interests who want to spend less on medical care. You know, if you give people, you know, good food and a good environment, you'll need less, you know, medical intervention. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. like, so, many ways, so in many ways you could actually be saving the people that would be, you know, ultimately responsible for the health care costs, even though it really trickles down to the consumer, at, you know, in the end. Oh, be, but uh, of be, course, and... and- and you know what? On the same penny, if you create such a unique environment for somebody to live in, you'll find, and people have found, that um, residents and visitors actually take better care of the property, which, of course, results in lower maintenance costs as well. Right. So there's, there's so many benefits. So, yeah, so, yeah. so speaking of uh, the money issue, uh, there, are there grants and economic incentives that help defray some of the costs? Yes, absolutely. There are several... Uh, government agencies that offer various grants, again, depending on the project and depending on the, uh, I guess, green benefit, if you will, or the biophilic benefit that the project is is offering in return. So there are certain grants that are available for roofs. There are other grants that are available for um, energy utilization, other grants that are available for water management, et cetera, et cetera. Um. So, so when people are purchasing commercial properties or larger residential buildings, what's their checklist to, so that when they talk to you, what are the things that they should not forget to mention to you as, as themes or items or checklist items? Because, uh, you know, there's all, I mean, it, it, it seems like the list could, is really robust. Um, how do you help people kind of focus on the basics, you know, the essentials? And then, and well, then, and then what's the sort of like, you know, wow, the, but if you really want, you know, but if you really want, you know, the leather seats, the moonroof, and the five-way adjustable seat, you want this. <laughs> exactly. That's why it, it really starts with uh, obviously touring the site or the property um, if it's an existing building and having a, de- you know, a lengthy meeting with the client to really get a, a good handle on, on what it is that the client is looking to achieve. If it's, uh, is it a quick repositioning of a property, or is this client looking to perhaps convert this into a condominium unit, maybe retain a few of the units for a longer-term ter- hold? Uh, is this a commercial property, like uh, you know, an, an open-air like shopping mall type of thing? Uh, so there are really different... <laughs> different answers depending on the uh, property. <laughs> are, are, are there are there more unique challenges in Manhattan versus other boroughs, or is it just sort of you know building has the building issues that they do? You know you can't really double park your stuff. <laughs> you know so supply delivery is always challenging. Um, you know the permit process is always long, and 
tedious, uh, you know, things like that. You have uh, people working on different projects. There's always delays and things like that. How, how does all that play into what you, that you do and what you try to overcome? Well, M- Manhattan is certainly a unique, a unique market uh, on its own right, and uh, I'm sure everybody agrees on that. Uh, it's incredibly competitive. So to start with that, we're not really charging people an arm and a leg for our services. I think we're coming in at a very reasonable rate because we do want to stay competitive. Um, there's uh, certain zoning laws and regulations that prohibit things that would be achievable in other markets in different parts of the country uh, versus the city. Um, that's why we love having a local architect on our team because that really helps cut through a lot of, you know, time that would otherwise be wasted. Um, let me think. So what other unique challenges in New York? Well, the parcels typically are smaller parcels, right? Your lot size is not as big as it typically is in, in more suburban markets or elsewhere in the nation, if you will. Um, you know, you, sometimes you would work on a parcel that's, uh, the lot size is only 2,500 square feet. Um, that's a bit unique. Like if you're comparing that to, for example, Atlanta, where I had some ex- experience working, you'll find typically parcels there are considerably larger. They don't really do 25 by 100 in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, <laughs> so, you know, things like that. Do, do, you, do you do rainwater capture in New York City? Yes, absolutely we do. How does that work? And, wh- and what would that save... Uh, building, you know, owners and tenants? Well, it, again, I don't want to make generalizations and I, I don't want to make any... Well, no, no, I mean, just conceptually. Just con- that, it's not like, you know, it's sort of like... Conceptually, yeah, yeah. it saves it saves tens of percent of, uh, you know, it results in, in drastic savings on your water bill. Uh, if only if you're using it for irrigation. Um, that alone um, says offsets a considerable amount of what you would otherwise spend on your water bill. Uh, just by having this, you know, capture container, uh, just to capture uh, rainfall and then obviously disperse it when the time comes. Right, and I that's know, a very low-tech solution, by the way. It's not very expensive. Because I know at certain, you know, Earth Day events, the New York City Parks Department gives out rain barrels. And I always think right. of that as sort of like, on one hand, they're spraying for mosquitoes because of stagnant water, and on the other hand, they want us to collect the water. So I'm not really sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not really sure. You know, but I wonder if there's a more robust solution where you can kind of capture the water and use it. I know you can't necessarily use it for drinking water, but you can certainly yeah. use it to water lawns, plants, tomato, the, the tomatoes, the corn, you know, whatever you're growing and things like that. Um, I mean, and, and depending on the design of the building in, uh, itself, you, you might even be able to use it for, for example, toilets, like gray water. You'd be right. Able to use it for. Well, you know, one of the really interesting shows that I did involved NASA. And, mm. you know, one of the questions that are often asked is, well, where does the water come from that you use on a space station or whatever? And the answer is they, mm. they recycle that water. <laughs> yep. They yeah. absolutely do. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we haven't on Earth. We haven't come down to that yet, but you know, we, we definitely have to think about how we use water. We did a show um, with Heather Kolar from H two O Cleanse, and she kind of said, "Look, this it's just one faucet. You know, when you think about it, it's just one big faucet. All the water just comes from one place, but yet you know it's used differently. And then the wastewater is really different. And then the question is like, what do you do with all that stuff? Because you can't." You know, you can't just kind of just dump all that water just back into the ocean or whatever. Cause you really, really cannot. And water is such uh, such an important resource, and we're losing it so fast. It's, uh, it's really quite scary when you think about it. Uh, but, yeah, there are very simple, low-tech solutions in place. And, uh, you know, I've... Born and raised in Israel, which is predominantly a desert country, which mostly suffers from drought. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm intimately familiar with these solutions from growing up. To us, it was just, you know, it was, it was just there. Um, each toilet has two handles, right? You could flush a big one or you could flush a small one. And each faucet has a water-saving little gizmo that's attached to it that 
the end user doesn't even feel any, dif- any difference uh, when you're using. But when you're seeing your water bills, trust me, you'll see the difference. And it's, it's a huge difference. Um, so, yeah, even simple, simple things like that. Uh, but that's an easy fix. That, that goes without saying almost. You know, I noticed that I think I think the Israelis invented this thing that sort of captures the water out of air, and they've deployed that in certain disaster zones so they can generate water where there's actually no water around. They could just pull it out of the air and kind of create a little bit. Right. You know, so that's is that something that is contemplated in building design? That's uh, that's a very interesting question. I have not seen that technique used in a building design. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure it's completely out of the realm of, you know, reason, considering, um, uh, you know, what, what <laughs> the, the water shortage right now in the world, um, and certainly looking ahead, um, maybe I gave you an idea, no, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I haven't seen that, that being used, um. Uh, so far. I, I would love to be the first one, though, to implement something like that in the States. So in the last couple of years, where do some of the cool ideas that you guys get come from? Do you, do you get a lot of trade shows? Do you sit around and, and look at problems, try to overcome them? Do you see who's out there innovating? Is it all of that? Yes, all of the above. I have uh, several friends, close friends, who are in the design and architecture space, uh, both in the States and elsewhere. And they keep feeding me all these cool ideas and cool companies from Sweden and Norway and the Netherlands and Israel and Australia and elsewhere. And there's, I mean, the world is so global right now that it's really, I think, impossible not to notice and pay attention to what other brilliant minds are doing halfway around the world and try to bring that to our own backyard. What are what are the what are some of the very current cool trends that you're seeing that are finally becoming a little bit more mainstream? Is it solar power? Is it uh, so I, the living wall? I, I would say the living walls. I would say probiotic air filtration, like you had mentioned. Uh, I had no idea that some other vendor is offering that, but there you go. So that's certainly uh, you know getting some momentum. Um, yeah, solar utilization, we've seen the efficiency rates on solar panels exponentially increase in the past, I would say, five, seven years. So you do see a lot of really creative ideas and, and patents when it comes to the solar space. Um, you know, you now have a certain film that you could apply on a regular window and make that window, um, you know, a solar a solar collector uh, generator, wow. essentially, yeah. So that exists. Um, I would say those, those are probably the main three things. Obviously, people always focus on energy conservation. So, right. yeah, you do see a lot of solar use. So with that, uh, dear listeners, that wraps up another show. I, I can't thank uh, Guy and Kristen, uh, who've been very generous with their time and their innovation. Uh, Rootedspaces.com. If you have any questions, you know, go to their website or send us an email, and, and I promise I will forward it to them. Uh, we look forward to your uh, future ventures, and maybe we'll, we'll come back on the show and you'll tell us some of the cool projects on a micro level, uh, what's going on. So I would love to. So, thank you, Richard. Uh, it's a privilege, and thanks for having us. All right. Thank you, thank guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you. I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll, 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 I'll love to take a picture in front of a living wall. Uh, for the show, so maybe we'll, we'll arrange that. So, so for that, <laughs> you got it. All right, so we'll. Sounds good. So that's it for the show. See everyone next week. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.